I, I hope I did well. I was like trying to make it really, <laughs> I'll, I'll try to go all out for this one. Yes. Yeah. Look, we'll, um, we'll get started. Um, that way we can just uh, spend as long as we want on different tasks and I'll let you act as the, uh, the miners canary and you are going to represent the whole course today. So yeah. please just interject with questions when you're ready. Yeah. Now just to, to run back, I mean, the content lecture this week, I mean, I basically said if you can throw together these, these seven concepts and you've got an idea of how these hang together, then you're in a really good position to start teaching um, chemical sciences. Now, I know that's a gross simplification, but if you understand um, and have a working definition of matter, that matter constitutes at least three different states, um, that it can be physically changed, um, that it can be broken down into elements. We've got 118 of them on the periodic table. Um, a substance can be made up of one particular type of atom. However, atoms can combine. They can become compounds. They can also become mixtures um, and substances. You know, they can make up a substance which can be mixed together um, either well or not well. They, they can, um, you know, uh, be emulsions. They can actually separate. And a chemical reaction is a rearrangement of atoms. It's where atoms actually do change. Um, and so, you know, we, if we work on those seven definitions, we really have the whole chemical sciences um, agenda nailed. Now, that's, that's a broad statement. Um, but, you know, again, for anyone who's got any gaps in your knowledge, I refer you to the primary science connections, um, the primary connections science background resources. And they really are just one page descriptors, which give you examples, simple diagrams, and you can work through any sort of uh, chemical sciences background issue or, or gap or knowledge gap that you perceive you might have. Even if you're warming up to teach something, it's really, really good to go back and get the basics from there. And it's, you know, primary connections are very, very well done. It's the E5 or 5E model. So it gives you all the, all the tools you need to get running there. Lauren, have you actually been there to have a look at the primary connections background stuff? Um, I have, I had a brief look around on it, but I haven't been able to have an in-depth look. Yeah, it, it's one of those lazy, rainy Sunday things to do. Mm. And, and you're probably more motivated to do it when you're actually teaching a, a chemistry unit. But the aim is to give you something to go forward with. So hopefully, um, you know, people will have a look at that when the time's right. It's definitely a good resource to have as a teacher. It is, particularly with assessment task number two, because we're looking at, primarily, I'm referring you to the primary connection side as your first port of call. You, you can do any, any, um, any, science group you can look at any lesson plans or learning sequences or, or units um, under any science community but the primary connections ones are particularly well set out so they're really really good for assessment task number two a couple of resources i sent people to look at today we don't have to be dull and boring we can run a unit on bashing biscuits we can run you know on melting chocolate drops um, kids even, love melting chocolate <laughs> ab absolutely and we're, we're looking at you know chemical change um, irreversible actions, gas to a solid, um, you know, burning a soot from a candle. I mean, it's a pretty boring way to do it. There are other ways to do it. Um, freezing liquids other than water and, you know, sugar and water. Yes, you can dissolve that, but have a look what happens to polystyrene cups when you start dis dissolving them with nail polishes and, and, um, and, and similar substances. So it's really quite a, a, a great result. You get to see what happens and it's much more dynamic. So have a look at some of those resources, give you some great ideas. Um, on the subject website this week, there wasn't a lot of actual hand, handwritten activities. It's mostly reflection and mostly looking at some examples of experiments we've put up there. But it's all about working with chemistry, you know, looking at those reactions. Um, spent time going through Loxley when we talk about resources. I really like the Loxley stuff this week, and I guess it comes through. It's just a nice narrative. It talks about the everyday use of chemical sciences, properties of matter, solid liquids. And it tells this wonderful narrative story, how you go down, you step down into the particle model of matter and you sort of say to yourself, oh, that's how everything happens. And particles, of course, they can change. They can move in multiple directions um, and then they can even reverse and resort back to their original forms. And we can look at atoms, elements, compounds, mixtures, and ultimately chemical change and, and major reactions. So um, Loxley does a great job there. My task is not to repeat it, but if you don't read anything at all this week, make sure you've read Loxley because it really is a nice narrative for the chemical sciences. And it's such a broad field. We can't assume that, you know, just by reading one textbook that we're actually going to know all the chemical sciences. It's dynamic and there's new resources coming out all the time. So our aim really from this week is to point you to those resources. The Smithsonian Institute, what a great step into things. You know, why not flip your classroom? If you're going to raise something of, of, of the chemistry, um, 
uh, subjects, then you know, use this timeline. It's brilliant. Who was it? When did it occur? What age? Why? What was happening in society at the time? You know, what was going on in the world? Okay, we start to see the proliferation of chemical sciences, the growth and explosion around about the, the late 1800s onwards. Have a look at this, connect it to science, because remember, science is a human endeavour, one of our strands. It's really important to make those connections where you possibly can. That's a good one, the Smithsonian Institute, and they've got a range, wide range of resources. Another reason why we're sending you there. Uh, the Royal Society of Chemists and their interactive um, periodic table. If you're like me and you just could never get into the, the periodic table, um, this actually breaks it down and explains to you why we've got the different periods, why we've got the different groups, um, how they're formed, uh, what their common properties are. Um, and to be honest, you know, as a primary school teacher, you may not use this terribly much, but then again, you might. Okay, there are ways of using it that you can, can be a lot of fun. The STEAM connections, uh, pointing you towards STEAM. Now, I'll pick this up a little bit next week when we talk about assessment. Um, but we, of course, went to the STEM generation, science, technology, education, maths. We now know that given our, our uh, comparisons and some <coughs> studies and PISA and TILS, and, uh, sounds like we've got a cyclone going on out there, and PISA and TILS and uh, a range of different OECD reports um, show that Australia is going backwards to, to our um, Western nation. So, you know, can I urge you please to have a close look at STEAM. STEAM is the, you know, the introduction of the arts. And just a, a slight example, ethical dilemmas. It's really, really important. Look at the science as a human endeavor. We teach science, but science has consequences for the planet. Science has consequences for mankind. Oh, can I just ask someone to muffle their mic there? That's uh, coming across quite, lo quite loud. Um, so have a look at that, that you know, the STEAM connections, the injection of the arts, okay? Ethical dilemmas, social consequences, the byproducts of sciences. And here's where STEAM comes into that, okay? Um, I'm gonna talk, move shift on to part two of this, this um, Zoom session. As you know, we cover the usual four parts. We go to the forums, the forums have been quiet. It seems like the Moodle has been really misbehaving this term. Um, I keep getting onto um, TASIC about it and keep getting the check, but um, you know, it's obviously periodic, there's dropouts. So I do apologize that it seems to be beyond our control. Um, but if we have a look at assessment task two, we've covered the resources that I really want to remind you about. Um, but assessment task two is talking about evaluating units of work. Now, the reason why I'm throwing this on your agenda now is because the topics we cover in the next couple of weeks actually you know are going to be directly speaking to assessment task two you know i don't want to waste your time i don't want to send you on a wild goose chase everything we do is going to be interconnected from this point forward now assessment task number one a couple of points that i can raise from there generally quite well done um it was pretty hard for people um what we're finding is a proliferation of people scoring in the credit range now the reason being um the, the nature of questioning that we saw. We weren't seeing, for instance, much differentiation in questioning between lower order and higher order questioning, between um, closed questioning and open questioning. Um, what we actually got to see was, was, you know, these are the sorts of questions I will ask. Um, and of course, you know, it's, that's all well and good, but when you're mapping out your, your lesson sequence, it is expected to, you know, probe. It is expected to go into those areas where a teacher needs to do that deep constructivist teaching. And so we would expect to see some, some you know, deeper questions happening there, some higher order knowledge questions being put, you know, and the structuring and the tools and the teaching techniques around that, whether they be jigsaw grouping, whether they be cognitive uh, um, maps, whatever it is you're doing or concept maps, a range of things to, to consider there. So you will get your feedback and your feedback sheets very much say, what a high level response was. And then we go through and address what aspects of your response were, were at that high level and what areas and gaps existed for you to improve. Now, the reason we do that is so that we can actually direct that feedback to assessment task number two. Now in this task, you've got to um, examine two consecutive units of science taught in primary school at a particular year level. So again, you're going to be picking your year. Um, for the early years, people, Bear in mind, you can teach under, under the uh, Queensland College of Teachers 
up to year three. So being in the early years level is no excuse for not actually picking up this particular um, uh, topic and looking at the, um, the F to 10 frameworks as, as uh, described by ACARA and the Australian Curriculum and Science. So it's really important to get that out straight away and also to get out the fact that you know, we're focusing on physical and chemical sciences only in assessment task number two. So if you submit something on the biological sciences or the earth and space sciences, um, be prepared to fail. Okay, it is very much physical and chemical sciences only. After you've examined two units, you then, in light of current research around effective practice and assessment in science, evaluate your formative and summative assessment used in these units of work. Evaluate formative and summative, okay? It's pretty explicit. You can use a table if you like to make your response explicit, but you've got to evaluate formative and summative assessment in those units of work. So it means you're gonna to have to identify them, okay? And where it is assessment for, assessment of, and assessment as learning. Now I'll pick this up in next week's lecture in some more detail in the content lecture and how those three views of assessment demonstrate student understanding and motivate and engage students in the learning process. Once you've identified and analysed the units, both of them, you then need to make at least two recommendations for improvement in the assessment used in those units. Using the knowledge you've gained throughout the course, okay, and also in your work as a teacher. And they've got to be justified by links to current research. So that is a code word for saying you are expected to research outside um, Gregson. You are expected to research outside Loxy, Loxley. You are expected to come up with some sources, academic sources, current research, current as in the last five years. And it should include redesign or development of those tools and techniques to make them more engaging to make them reliable. And I'll go through the principles of assessment next week in the content lecture, but there, there are about nine clear principles, including reliability, validity, generalizability. Um, and also it must enable us to make judgments on students learning. So it's a, it's a pretty structured task. It's a pretty um, detailed task. And it also um, is three and a half thousand words. So it's quite a long and challenging task too. The must-do criteria, I urge you please to have a good look at the rubric. We've talked about rubrics and assessment. We'll talk about it a little more, more next week when we look at assessment uh, strategies. Rubrics are brilliant because they alert the learner um, to what's coming up in the assessment, what the key components are. So please look at ours. You've got to have a sophisticated explanation, a sophisticated explanation of the formative and summative assessment used in each of the two units of work. So that's at least four for each unit. So formative and assess summative, two units of work, two of each, minimum. You've got to have explicit identification of the types of assessment used in each of the units of work. So you've got to know it, you've got to smell it, see it, touch it, feel it, and describe it and justify it in terms of the unit. And then hopefully, value add to it. You've got to give a comprehensive explanation of how the types of assessment used demonstrate student understanding and motivate and engage learners. And you've also got to provide two appropriate recommendations. So as you can see, um, we've got four key criteria there. They're all equally weighted. So even though the two appropriate recommendations are probably the hardest area for you to integrate um, current research, that's where you know it, it's only one of the four criteria. So it will be equally weighted. So please, they are the must do criteria. And the two recommendations you come up with must be recommendations of assessment for, of, and as learning. Recommendations are justified by links to current research. They've got to be clear and concise. You've got to demonstrate clear and accurate understanding of your science concepts and how they relate to assessment. Your writing has got to be cohesive. I mean, um, you know, I, I'm coming across people in their reports, you know, instead of using the, the impersonal pro pronoun of you, they're actually just writing the letter you. Now, look, that's okay in a web blog. That's okay in a text to a friend. It's not okay in an academic piece of work. And the tutors are actually picking this up, okay? The markers in this course are picking it up and they, they are, you know, writing back to you and, and pulling you down on those criteria. So we want extensive use of relevant and credible sources for explanation of your, your scientific concepts and your assessment models. Now, that's a must, okay? Some people still are sticking to Loxley and Gregson. Um, look, Loxley and Gregson are a starting point. They're, they're a, a springboard. They're not the be all and end all. So I urge you please, when you're completing assessment task number two, 
go beyond your textbooks. If you don't, you will be struggling to get above a C. Now, moving on. Um, some of the challenges facing primary school teachers in delivery of quality science education, and this is behind um, this particular assessment task. It, it's a low priority. Um, we've got an unachievable syllabus, and we know that from just looking at the, the chemical sciences. Good Lord, you know, we had a, a week on chemical sciences. Um, you know, it, all we can do is whet the appetite and sort of say, this is teachable. You know, so I make no apologies for that. Um, hopefully, you've done your chemistry, uh, science prerequisites. Hopefully, you are able as a teacher to pick up the technology of teaching science and to become a co-learner with your, your students as you're going through this process. Most of us do learn on the job. Most people teaching science are what we call out of area teachers. Okay, so you're, you're not in a, a camp of your own. There's inadequate resourcing in science education. And there's also limited opportunities for teachers to actually see quality teaching of science and pre-service teachers in particular. Um, and, you know, I don't know how your experience in schools coalesce with that, but, you know, perhaps you, you could say the same sort of thing. There's limited time for science education units and pre-service teacher courses. And guess we're experiencing that too. One week on chemical sciences, one week on assessment in chemical sciences coming up. Limited understanding of decision makers of the issues of teaching primary science, particularly decision makers in schools. Limited understanding of science itself. And change-weary teachers. Now, we're seeing a lot of this, particularly as we go out and visit students in schools on PRAC. Um, a lot of stress schools, schools are stress systems. You know, teaching anything in schools is a challenge. So we can look here particularly at um, the, the primary connections model. Now, it actually takes professional learning because it provides you with resources and curriculum units. And it's built on five pillars. Collaborative learning, the E5 or 5Es model, science and literacy, investigations, science investigations, and assessment. So when you're looking at these units, because you are required to review two of them, bear in mind they're all built on the same five pillars. You will see collaboration, you'll see the five E's, you'll see science and literacy, it will be all based on investigation, and, and the assessment will talk to that five E's model. And I'll speak about that in a minute. So scientific literacy is, you know, Dennis Goodrum bangs on about this constantly in Science by Doing. Um, it's, it's a high priority for our citizens. It's about changing the world. It's about becoming a, a citizen, you know, in, in, in the Aristotelian sense of what a citizen is, an informed decision maker. And of course, you can see here our three strands come together, having a science understanding, having inquiry skills, and picking it up as a human endeavour. Now, when we look at collaborative learning, we can see that, you know, Primary Sciences and Primary Connections is all about creating collaborations. And the focus, um, just to give you some broad generalisations, in, in uh, Kindergarten to Two or Foundation to Two, we often see the units designed around working in pairs. And you can see the focus here on pair-to-pair -pair, um, communication. One becomes a speaker, one becomes a manager. Okay, often in the tasks that are set in these units. Now, this is a generalisation, but it's also a model. So when you're looking at Primary Connections, look for some of the formative assessment cues here. Because at this stage, you know, at the formative assessment stage in the, in the K2 or F2 model, you, you've usually got a lot of care work going on. Years three to six, it comes teams. It becomes teams. So you've usually got teams. Those teams usually have roles assigned to each person in the team. Um, the three basics are usually director, manager, and speaker. Sometimes the teams can be bigger than that. And sometimes, and usually, to be effective with collaborative uh, learning, each role in a team will have a team learning card. So look for all of these things when you're looking at the primary connections model because in here lies your formative assessment. This is what assessment task number two is all about. Formative assessment and summative assessment taken together. The five E's, okay, another pillar. What is it? Well, we know, for instance, it's an inquiry model of teaching and the learning, and it's all about conceptual change to facilitate conceptual change. That is to take a student from their point of entry through a point of departure where they will leave, hopefully, with, with a remodeled and reconfigured understanding, certainly with an elaborated view of the world. But bear in mind, you can't change all of their, their every child's uh, thought pattern. You, can't, you can only sort of work away at their attitudes. And I remember that fully. I, I remember one, a lovely young guy called Ben McAvoy that I taught um, many, many years ago in Year 7 Science, and Ben's family were um, um, Seventh-day Adventists, and, and his father was a pastor and had quite rigid, 
creation beliefs. And in some of the science classes, you know, Ben just simply said, I can't accept that. I can't believe that because it's counter to the teachings of my family and church. And so even though he intellectually became aware of the issues, um, philosophically and morally and ethically, he didn't shift. Ben went actually on to become a chemist, chemical scientist working for CSIRO and um, has actually managed as an adult to incorporate his belief systems. So, um, you know, it's about conceptual change. It doesn't have to happen overnight, but it happens. Uh, a really important chart here. Now, Lauren, you're, you're online. Um, can I ask you to have a look at this chart, please? And, and the two things I want to point out here, the five E's are clearly al aligned for you, but going down the right-hand side of the chart are the key things here. Formative assessment comes in at the explore and explain stage. Okay, summative assessment comes in at the elaborate and evaluate stage. Now, a lot of people are surprised to see this box here summative assessment of the science inquiry skills. That's what we do at the elaborate stage. Lauren, do, does that make sense to you? Yeah, that, that seems pretty reasonable to me. Good, now one piece of feedback from assessment task one, not a lot of students seem to understand that the elaborate stage actually was about doing science inquiry skills. Many students didn't even include science inquiry skills on, on their elaborations and, and, and substrand identifications for the learning sequence they were doing. And yet here it is in the five E's. It's mm -hmm. an important part. So if you're not putting it in there, if you're not addressing that in your assessment and your assessment strategies, then please bear in mind, you're limited in terms of the outcomes you can get for an assignment like this. And you're also limiting the options for your learners. It's really important. Have a close look, remember this chart. Because when you're looking at assessment task number two, it's about formative assessment. So you'll identify what's happening at the explore and explain stage. And then you go straight to elaborate and evaluate where you can look at this summative assessment tasks. And have a look at this. One, two, three, four. For your assessment task number two, you've got to come up with two. Take two recommendations. And here we've got one, two, three, four. So if you can come up with one for it, the formative explore stage, one for the explain stage, one for the elaborate stage, one for the evaluate stage, you've met that requirement beautifully. So it's not an onerous task, but it does require you to think it through. And please, you know, here is the structure for you. It's really, really explicit. Once you've done your engagement, you're instantly off on exploring and for formative assessment. Then you're into the explain stage where we're doing the reconstruction of, of concepts. Okay, and from there we're moving into the summative assessments where we're applying that reconstruction through inquiry skills and ultimately coming out with evaluate, applying those inquiry skills and that reconstruction to a scientific world of understanding. So the overarching message from um, Primary Connections is that every unit basically has one key conceptual idea. Okay, it's got one key conceptual idea. And sometimes that will be broken across a lesson sequence of six things. You may look at change, okay, substances changing. And, you know, the final unit may be baking biscuits. But there's one key conceptual idea running through that entire unit. And it spans the entire 5E sequence and it should be emphasised and referenced often. The lessons build from one to the next, contributing to the key idea. Now, we had some experience of this in assessment task number one, and some of you will get feedback saying you did it very, very well and consistently, and others will be saying there are gaps in what you did. But it is one conceptual idea and a lesson sequence flowing from that. And the actions must be considered with, consistent with the purpose of the phase which, which you're trying to develop. SCAMP, and SCAMP has actually written a new textbook. We're looking at it, using it for next year. Um, but every phase in the 5Vs model is important for optimum learning. None are unnecessary and none should be omitted. The impact of omitting a phase needs to be pointed out because the analogy he uses here is keystones. And just like a keystone, if you knock the keystone out of an archway, the other stones supporting it are gonna collapse. So it's really important with the 5E's model. You know, you have a close look at the assessment stages, the formative assessment stages. You have a close look at the summative assessment stages because they are all integrated. The investigations, science investigations, well, there are types of, of investigating primary connections. Um, there are basically two types. There are exploratory investigations embedded in, in primary connections, and there's also what we call the FAIR test, the survey design and secondary data investigations. Now, 
exploratory investigations occur at the engage and explore phases, okay? And they're characterized by formative assessment and they include the scientific model, observe, measure, test, represent. Fair tests, again, usually occur at the elaborate stage, okay, at the elaborate stage. So it's talking more about the summative, okay, and it's talking mostly at investigations, of course, are skill-based and are characterized by a focus on student planning, investigating a process, representing findings, and very much swimming around in the literacies of science, drawing conclusions based on evidence and communication. So when you're looking at primary connections, you know, what I'm trying to say to you here is they are written with a certain model in mind. That model addresses assessment, uh, as, uh, both formative and summative at various stages. So when you're doing assessment task number two, look for those clues. They're in every primary connections model as are the stages of investigating, okay, right from planning, conducting, interpreting, representing, evaluating, and communicating findings. So please have a look at each of those phases. They are embedded. Claims, 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 representations. I mean, we, you know, constantly banging on about student representations. Whenever student rep makes a representation about a science phenomena, whether it's verbal, written, gestured, or drawn, they're making a claim about what they do or don't understand. They're your gold. Their insights into your students' thinking. So wherever you see those popping up, it is a formative assessment opportunity. Now, next week, I'm going to post on, on our, our subject website. Um, I'll remodel the week's teaching actually a little bit because I've put some tasks up there, but I've, I've actually rethought the tasks. I've got some that are more useful for you. I'm going to give you a lot of examples of formative assessment techniques that you can actually start thinking about and maybe use to, to critique and improve the primary connections models that you're going to review. Purposes of investigations, there they are, taken straight out from Dennis Goodrum's research, actively engage, provide opportunities, learning opportunities, authentic experiences, understanding scientific evidence and the nature of science, and provide, provide a foundation for conceptual development um, through ongoing experience of, of science phenomena. So science is not static. Um, one piece of science connects to another, connects to another. It's a model of explanation. And again, coming back, the five E's and, and, and learning model, coming back constantly again to where these fit in. Now, it's really important as we're looking at assessment task number two, that we're actually structuring our understanding where the five E's, because every primary connections model unit is based on this model. Every primary connection goes through these steps. Every primary connections unit can be assessed, can be read from a diagnostic, formative and summative assessment frame, okay? The aim here is to help you understand how to read these units so that you can better evaluate them and better complete assessment task number two. Science and literacy, a big part of this. When we talk about the literacies of science, we know what they are. We can smell them, we see them in our textbooks. They're in Gregson, they're in Loxley, they're in all the articles we read. They are our particular language practices. Now, the notion of a fractal, believe it or not, we often think it's a scientific concept. It's actually a linguistic concept. A fractal is a word that is stripped down to its very smallest sense. In science, we think a fractal is something that's stripped down to its very smallest particle description. Um, science borrowed that from language. There's very little that's original about science. Science is, you know, it's supposed to be the home of originality. What it is, it's actually an amalgamation of other knowledges that have been strung together and other practices. And in this case, our language practices, we, the whole of assessment task number one was based on misconceptions, misconceptions embedded in language. So it's very hard to separate science and language and therefore the literacies of science as we know them. But we know they're multimodal. Um, we know that it's factual, it's third person, it's often really dispassionate. And we've all seen science fiction movies where the spaceship talks, etc., etc. We know it's full of data tables. We know it's full of label diagrams, symbols, graphs, models, drawings, computer generated images, gestures, role plays. Next week, I'll give you a couple of examples on how that can be made into a bit of fun. For instance, the worm. How do we teach that to early childhood? Um, okay, we can cr actually create a feedback worm for students. When we begin a unit, we can create a, 10 little circles, one with a worm face on it, one with a worm tail. And in each of those little circles, we can actually put our milestones for that student's learning. So the student actually gets to build their worm over the term as they go through and complete all of their science investigations and science learnings. They get a little bit of their worm every time they achieve something. So by the end of the unit, parents can come in and there's a room full of worms, a wall full of worms, you've got your worm wall. And you know, here's Stacy's little worm. Um, and everything's dated when she did things and the phases she went through. 
beautiful little representation of a scientific literacy. We you know circuit wires, on off switches, globes, batteries. We had an interaction earlier from, you know, in week four where we looked at, at um, an online interaction uh, where we looked at you know, circuitry and this is a common scientific literacy. So what is it? It's the use of everyday literacies to learn about science concepts and process. Now the reason why I'm putting this in here is because you will see that the, the primary connections units have a huge section committed to cross-curricular connections and also to sustainability. So you'll see that embedded in the, in the primary connections units. So have a good look at them. Um, it's all about the literacies of science. It's about locating and embedding the student and the learner in the literacies of science and how scientific literacy can assist them to grow and develop and communicate their understandings. Defining it, what is it? Scientific literacy is a high priority. Again, good room. Be interested in, understand the world, engage in discourses, be skeptical and questioning, be able to identify questions, investigate, draw evidence, to make informed decisions about the environment, their own health and well-being. You can see our three you know, scientific strands in, embedded there, our understandings, our inquiry processes, and also um, the human endeavour, you know, the consequences and, and, and side effects uh, of science and the scientific uh, community. Assessment. Um, and the ACS achievement standards. Again, a point I want to go back to about assessment task number one. Some of you will get feedback where you, you've actually gone through um, creating assessment in your little learning sequence, but you have not at any stage referred to the ACS achievement standards. In other words, what would a competent level of knowledge or a competent level of performance in a unit look like? Now, the ACS achievement standards gives us that. So any time we talk about assessment, we must always have at the back of our mind our achievement standards. And Primary Connections does this incredibly well. Incredibly well, okay? The achievement standards are identified at the, you know, the completion of each unit. Okay? And that is designed to assist and support your reporting functions as well. So again, we go back here to this diagram. You know, when we talk about diagnostic assessment, we're looking here at, at how you're going to teach, what the gaps in, in learners' knowledge are. Next week, I'll give you a, a range of support activities and tasks you can use to get going on diagnostic assessment. Some really, really fun activities that you can use. Explore, we move straight into formative assessment. Explain, we're straight into a formative assessment where students are getting hands-on experience, where they're looking at scientific explanations for the observation of just day-to-day -day phenomena that they're seeing. They're trying to develop conceptual understandings. They're trying to find a scientific literacy to describe what it is they see. Down here, we start to elaborate that. We're moving into something. So how do we do it? So now we need to apply what we know. We need to convert it into a test, some kind of test, some sort of um, investigation that you know, we can actually apply these through a student planned investigation. So notice the key words there, student planned. Okay, the student is leading this. And finally, we get down to evaluate, where the student is now re-representing or you know, representing their understanding and reflecting on their learning journey, and the teacher is collecting evidence about achievement of those outcomes. So they're actually taking that understanding and inflicting it on the world. Some types of assessment, diagnostic, here we go. The great integration of, of the arts, as I said, and some of the reasons why I'm, I'm putting forward these ideas. Next next week, I'll bring up a few more for you. Um, you know, the whole notion of STEAM, of maker spaces. How do I demonstrate my understanding? Well, you know, the arts create a wonderful vehicle for doing that. Have a look at this diagnostically. We've got it there. My idea about the earth. Formatively, okay, here they're building a model. And ultimately, summatively, Okay, looking obviously at the rotations of Earth, Sun and patterns and, and of course the evolution of, of time and time as a concept. So we can look at types of assessments um, and, and you know, look at the tasks there. You know, only one of them is a paper and pen task and that's probably necessary at that stage. Okay, the rest are very much, you know, at the formative stage, the doing, the summative stage. We can see the applications, they're testing their concepts. We hear a lot about assessment for, assessment of, and assessment as. Um, we'll pick this up in the content lecture next week in some, some detail. But assessment for learning, and we covered it in this week's material, um, it's gathering information about the gap between where student is and where the student needs to be. 
and we can see the connections there. Very diagnostic in its focus. Understand clearly what they're trying to learn, what's expected of them. Given feedback, and feedback must be timely and relevant. Given advice, and they're fully involved in deciding what needs to be done next and who can help if needed. Assessment of learning. We see here a couple here. Gathering and working with evidence to enable teachers and the wider to, to evaluate students' progress. Judgment about the extent and quality of student learning. And it's got to be based on sound criteria negotiated with and known to the students. And it's got to be reliable and accurate. And there's a couple of examples there of assessment of learning. And the sticky papers, brilliant one. As you can see, we've got a time chart here. Axis, vertical, horizontal axis, just made up with sticky paper and different conceptual steps and milestones going on in each of those stages. Assessment as learning, okay, as students are going through a task, they reflect on the evidence of learning and the processes of learning. And you will see this very much in the primary connections units, reflecting on what they've learned, how they've learned it, what processes have helped them to learn. And as you can see, for instance, the little light bulbs, I need help with this, I can do this myself, I can help others with this. So if you're looking at tasks um, and reviewing the primary connections uh, uh, units, then keep an eye out. You know, these, these are maybe among some of the areas of recommendation that you can make when you look at these units, um, because a lot of them are really, really good comprehensive teaching units, um, but there's sometimes there's learning gaps in the units. See if you can pick them out and review them and come up with some strategies and recommendations. Questioning is critical. It was a big part of assessment task number one. Um, and again, we, we, you know, we're, we're looking here, um, again, for formative assessment and, and also for summative assessment. It's really important when you're doing a summative assessment to you know, be looking at effective, deep, deep, deep knowledge questions. Um, and if our questioning is good, then our, our assessment is going to be good. And um, you know, some of the feedback from assessment task number one, students different, actually didn't differentiate in their questioning. You know, it was just a generic open question to an entire group of learners. Um, and there was no unpacking of a concept. There was no unpacking of misunderstandings. There was no unpacking of the space and language that had been put forward. Um, you know, in the lesson sequence, they were just open-ended questions and very general and focused. So please, you know it. So why not demonstrate it when you're looking and reviewing these models? Now, assessment task number one was, was a tough one because it put you in the position of producing the, the science knowledge and, and the science sequence. Quest assessment task number two puts you in the chair of the expert. So you're gonna to have to arm yourself with some tools, you're gonna to have to arm yourself with some critical literature, and you will be able to look at you know, the questioning scaffolds throughout that particular um, primary connections unit and comment on it and even make some suggestions. Effective questioning. Um, primary connections looks at this too. What are the broad questions? Uh, the fat ones, ones that encourage and engage people. What are the narrow questions, the skinny ones, the ones that probe? And what is the purpose of wait time? And you know, we've covered this um, three weeks ago in, in, in content three weeks ago. Wait time actually increases. Um, it's quantumly connected to, to learning. Um, if you in incorporate one sing Someone talking, yeah, just question there. Um, everyone's familiar with the concept of wait time? Can I ask Wendy, you're, you're online, do you have a mic there? Yes, I think it's finally working. Can you hear me? I can, Wendy, yes. What do you understand by wait time? Oh, we've gone quiet. The oh. amount of time that we actually wait for something. And for a response, for a learner response, isn't it? Yeah, and so often it's really good when you're using a fat question, you throw a broad question out there and you see the movement around the class. You see the faces come alive. You see other faces drop. So you give it a little more time. Now, often an argument, if anyone's re read, read the book Quiet, you will understand this, this world, our classrooms are actually geared towards, they're structured for extroverts. You know, introverts, the people who process things deeply, who take a little bit more time to get their words out of their lips. These are the ones who often miss out on these learning opportunities. And wait time is a fabulous way of d democratizing the classroom, of giving space for the, the introverts and the semi-introverts so that the extroverts can actually learn to balance their processes. 
you can use it once. First of all, when you use a, a you know, particular open-ended question, wait time can also be used very effectively with a learner when you're using a skinny question, you're directing a narrow, closed question to a particular person. So these principles of effective questioning, again, we'll revisit some of the science by doing models um, over the next couple of weeks as we're looking at this assessment task, just to have a look at what it makes up effective questioning. Because when you're reviewing the primary connections units, that is assessment task number two, you're going to need to make recommendations. And it may well address the notion of questioning. So when we look at the five E's model, you'll see some structures here. At the engage stage, they've got broad questions, encourage students to discuss their ideas and experiences. So very fat questions there. Explore questions that encourage students to discuss their ideas and express common experiences, a mix of narrow and broad questions. Explain very focused questions that reinforce the explanations of the concept. So what you're doing here is reinforcing your teaching. You're engaging in a lot of reconstruction here. So you're talking about the concepts and you will be using very focused questions. Elaborate questions that help students to understand the concept in new situations that as assess inquiry skills. So again, we're again, application type questions. And finally, evaluate questions that assess the student's understanding. So we can see here, you can work your way and assign a, you know, a, a bloom title to each of those phases if you like, or you can simply refer to those questioning uh, paradigms that, that are embedded in each stage of the five E's or the E5 model. You can see there that as you read the primary connections unit, look for these clues, okay? You know, that these units are not put together um, accidentally, they're very deliberately designed. And if you follow that design, and look for these clues, you will find assessment task so much more easy, easily done. Um, so, you know, I, I recommend that you understand how these are written. If you can understand the design of these units, then this assessment task should be a, a walk in the park. It should actually be you know, an armchair ride. You're sitting there, you're looking at someone else's work, you're understanding it, you're reframing it, you're putting critical literature lens on it, and then you're making four recommendations about things that could either differentiate the curriculum more, improve it, modify it, or focus it more for assessment. You know, so you're not necessarily saying this sucks. You're saying here is an, 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 a value add. Here is something that could be added to this. Here is my recommendation. So that's really assessment task number two. Now, next week, um, you will see when I get on the, um, the subject website, I'm going to try and get the forum going. This week, you'll see that there's actually a chemical quiz up there. Um, so um, I sat down and actually uh, bothered to put together a chemistry quiz for week six. And you'll see it's, it's not assigned. Um, you will get a mark out of 10. You can re-attempt re it as many times as you like. But what it's done is basically to understand um, the principles. You know, we talked about the seven principles of week six, um, ranging from matter right through to chemical change, those are the seven principles. Um, those 10 questions basically work you through those. Um, and gives you an opportunity to um, explore and, and test your knowledge. It's not assessed. You'll get a mark out of 10, but it doesn't go, it goes, doesn't go into your grade book. It simply um, says, okay, you got seven out of 10. You got eight out of 10, you got 10 out of 10. Um, well done, and move on. Um, this week, we're going to use the, um, the forum. And the task I really want you to do is, is we're gonna start analyzing uh, um, a, a primary connections unit. Um, now, if we can do this and, and, and you know, again, get yourself into a group of six people, um, you know who you work well with, you know who you connect with, you've spent uh, other units uh, of study together. So um, there's people you do work well together, get together, um, agree on a year level, agree on a unit, and let's collaboratively start getting stuck into this. Let's use it on the forum. So I've got a structured task here. It's got four parts to it. Um, so pick, a, pick your science uh, connect primary connections unit. Um, summarize the science understanding at the front of the unit. Okay, step number one. Step two for the explore and explain 5E's phase of the unit, identify and summarize the following, and you usually find it in the appendices. Scientific explanations for observations, the learning activities and hands-on experience of the phenomenon. Questioning focuses and practices, how these develop scientific explanations and conceptual understandings, and the collaborative learning activities. So in those two phases, what's going on in the formative assessment area? Explore and explain. Task number three, for the elaborate and evaluate phases, we're looking here at the summative assessment. Okay, extend understanding to a new context. How does this unit extend understanding to a new context or make connections to additional concepts through student plan investigations? And how do students re-represent their understanding and reflect on their learning and journey 
and how are teachers collecting evidence about the achievement of outcomes? Can you see assessment task number two here? Um, so if we can do this you know, collaboratively as a group, um, it's going to make assessment tasks so much easier. So then the final stage, of course, just report back to your group in your summary, discuss it, share it, you know, workshop it. Even though we live in very separate parts of North Queensland and, and Australia, there is no reason why we have to work alone. This is not a competition. Um, it's a situation where everybody wins and collaborative learning is the, the model of primary connections. So why don't we pick it up and use it to learn about primary connections? Here is a task that will be on the forum next week. I encourage you, please get into it. It can save you so much. Your group may then decide to pick a second unit and together you have gone through and analysed assessment task number two. You may then want to go further in the week nine forum and start doing some literature reviews and find some you know, critical literature that you can use in your assessment task number two, which of course is a key component of that task. This is the beginning of, I think, of making assessment task number two so much easier to do. You don't have to do it alone. You don't have to wonder whether you're on the right track. You have a, you know, a whole resource of peers sitting beside you in this virtual world waiting to make connections. So I'm going to stop there um, and open the floor to any questions. We have a very small group here today. Um, I think there's only three of us online, uh, but it's nice. Um, can I throw over to, to Wendy and Susan? See, any questions you've got or any concepts you'd like to revisit at this point? Colin, where did you read the um, all about the assessment task too? Because what I'm looking at hasn't got what you've written. Okay. Right, what I'll do is I will drag the page onto my main screen. And there it is there. So in under the assessment link here, I'll actually I'll just go to the subject home page. There we are. And you can see down on the assessment side here, we've got assessment task number two, evaluation of the units. Oh, okay. Now I've I've got that. I clicked on that and I uh, clicked on the You will find um, the, the description here. Yep. Yep, I just what well, as well as going through it, it was just was sound, looked a little bit different to the way you're reading it out. Yep. Look, my apologies. What I'm trying to do here is unpack it a little bit for you. Oh, okay. Yeah. So um, again, the the whole aim is what appears on the paper is is a very um, surface level description of what we expect. What mm. I'm trying to do is just flash up some some you know some traffic lights. Here is you know a red light. You must do this. Um, here is an orange light. You could look at these areas, and here's a green light. Now, here's the things you probably think you're doing. Here's an orange light. Here's some things you probably want to think about, and here's a red light. Things you must actually think about. Um, so that's the approach I'm, I'm taking here today, um, just at this early stage to get you thinking about assessment task number two. Yeah, and, and so just again, just to paint that scenario, it's you know, with the primary connections units are up online in assessment for you. Has everyone been able to find those? They're in the um, Scoodle. They are in Scoodle indeed, but you will find some up on here too. Um, yes. Yeah, so we, we tried to, you know, um, under assessment task number two, and there's a couple of sample tasks there from, uh, be wary of those. Some of those sample tasks didn't score highly. Okay, but they're up there as samples, as examples, not exemplars. So they're two very different things. And here you've got some primary connections units that you can actually bite into. If you, um, for instance, Wendy, not everybody's found them on Scoodle. So, you know, um, there are some examples here. And there are some other um, Australian curriculum science uh, units down here below as well that you can use if you don't actually want to use the primary connections. But the nice thing about primary connections is it's got the five E's. The five E's are beautifully connected to diagnostic, formative, and summative assessment. You know, follow your nose on that one, I think. I went to the um, primary connections workshop down at Rockhampton recently. And how did you find it? That was fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. I've, I've used them before and um, I intend to use them again. They, yeah, but they've given me um, a sheet, um, I might scan it and put it up, of all of their um, units that are on Scootle. So maybe if they went onto Scootle and they could um, use the keywords, they might be able to find them a bit easier. That's, that's great, Wendy. That's, um, that's if I do that. Fabulous. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful.
yeah, not not everybody uses Scoodle um, as 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 much as some of us, and some don't use it at all. So that would be certainly a good invitation to to get into Scoodle and get involved because uh, that the units are there. So it's great. Thank you. And Susan, anything you'd like to add? You think people may be thinking or wondering about or querying? I think I might have a more few more next week once uh, all this information processes and gets through the brain. All right, thank you. My aim is not to scare you. My aim is you know, to alert you, not alarm you. Yeah. Um, this this assessment task is quite structured. And yeah, it looks very um, very much set out. Like we just sort of almost fill in the blanks a little bit. Very much so, but it's the quality of what you do that, that matters. And, and there's also, it's two stages. There's reading the unit. So you've actually got to report back three parts of the assessment are about how you've read the unit, how you've identified the assessment, um, where you've connected the assessment to, to engagement, motivation, et cetera, et cetera. And the fourth part is where you would make recommendations about how you could add value to what sits there. You know, you may take a particular student group. You may want to add an indigenous perspective. You know, you may want to make a recommendation that, you know, the primary connections people are not thinking about here. And that's, you know, it's, for that reason, it, it is a very structured assessment task. But yet, I would imagine that, you know, no two responses would look very alike. Because there's so much you know, in there that's different that you could focus on. On that note, if there's no further questions, please, I'll, I will uh, hit the um, save button and get this posted onto the uh, uh, YouTube for you. Um, and please keep the questions coming in. This forum task will be up for you next week. Don't worry about it now. Um, but the content lecture will address this um, pretty succinctly. And the aim is to get you working in groups and get you actually functioning and thinking about this. It's a very doable assessment task. Um, the aim though is to pick up on the detail, you know, to get the devil in the detail. And if you've done that, then you know, you're looking forward to a really good result and to something that you can use well into the future. All right, thank you all very much. Um, take care. And again, I will post this uh, to the website. Thank you.